Okay, so um, it's really wonderful to introduce to you um, Dr. Jennifer Daly, um, Dr. Ed Weber, and Dr. Kevin Nash. So um, I don't think Kevin and Ed need any introduction to this community, um, but I feel like it's my duty to introduce them. Um, Dr. Weber is obviously one of the most revered clinicians and scientists in, not you're not a clinician, you're a scientist, but <laughs> I won't give you too much credit, um, in, in our community. Um, he has really given hope to families um, beyond very few others, and he did that at a time when there really was not a whole lot on the playing field for, for our kids. So um, obviously we all think incredibly highly of him, but him and Dr. Daly, and Dr. Daly being his graduate student years ago, um, published the first paper on AAV delivery of gene therapy for Angelman syndrome in mice. So um, it's beautiful how the world goes around in a circle because now Dr. Daly is um, working on the human um, preclinical work to hopefully a human clinical trial for AAV and Angelman syndrome um, alongside again with Dr. Weber and Dr. Nash um, for Agilis. So um, Dr. Daly is um, now, I'm just trying to get your title because it changed. Um, yes, so Dr. Daly is, um, you're not just the director of research. So she is, that's a really great title. She is the director of research at Agilis for their gene therapy programs, and Angelman <laughs> syndrome is the one that she is um, currently working on most extensively, as it seems, in University of Florida. So um, Ed and Kevin and Jen, we are very grateful to have you here. Hi, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around for the last talk of the day today. And I also want to thank FAST for inviting us to speak today. I am very excited about sharing with you some of the work that we've been doing in collaboration with Dr. Ed Weaver and Kevin Nash at the University of South Florida. As Allison mentioned, I initially started in this field about 10 years ago as a graduate student in Ed's lab. And as she said, the world's kind of funny and I'm very grateful to be back in this field again working with them as the director of research for Agilis. Agilis was founded in 2013, so we've been around for a few years now. We're located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, so if you guys are in the area, feel free to stop by and say hello to us. And the main focus of our company is to develop innovative gene therapies, particularly for rare CNS disorders, such as Angelman syndrome. Agilis is really involved in all aspects of the design and development of these novel gene therapies. And we heard a little bit about this in the previous talk, but this starts at the very basic beginning, identification of our target gene. And once we've identified which gene we are interested in replacing, there are then an assortment of other questions. So what type of, what serotype are we using? This is an important question to answer because our choice could significantly alter the behavior of our viral vector meaning that we could target specific cell types, increase expression levels, target different regions in the body. So these are all questions that have to be answered. Once you have your optimal viral vector that you've designed, you then have to decide how you're going to deliver this. We've heard about several different um, trials that are currently going on, and for many of these, it may make sense to have a peripheral administration something through um, an intravenous delivery or intrathecal administration. But when you look at a disorder such as Angelman syndrome, where we know that the protein is deficient primarily in the neurons of the brain. So for an indication like this, does it make more sense to do a direct injection of our viral vector into the brain? So these are all questions that we've had to ask ourselves and address. And I'm not gonna go into too much detail because Ed's going to um, go into a lot of the work that's been done um, to answer these questions. So at Agilis, we currently have several projects in our pipeline. Um, the first one would be uh, for AADC deficiency. And I'm gonna go into this in a little bit more detail coming up, but I just wanna point out that we are in clinical trials for a gene therapy product used to address this, but we're also currently developing products for Frederick ataxia and of course, Angelman syndrome. And I also want to point out that Agilis has received um, both orphan drug designation and orphan medicinal product status for all three of these programs. And why is that important? So in 1983, 
the Orphan Drug Act was, um, was enacted and this was designed to entice researchers and industry leaders into coming into the rare disease spectrum. So we've heard a lot of information today about potential therapeutics that are identified in the lab and the effort that it takes to move that into a clinical trial. But one thing that you know, we really need to keep in mind is that one of the biggest rate limiting steps for the development of a novel therapeutic is oftentimes the cost for research and development. So many companies are um, concerned that if they go into a rare disease space, that they could potentially have difficulty recouping that money that they've invested into their research and development program. And so the FDA realized that this was a potential issue and implemented economic incentives to help mitigate these issues. These are things like seven years of market exclusivity, tax incentives for R&D, eligibility for fast-tracking FDA review. So these are things that have been implemented to help encourage researchers to um, work more on rare diseases. As a result, as of the beginning of 2015, the FDA has granted orphan drug designation to over 3,200 potential therapies. There have been nearly 500 orphan drugs approved since this act was passed, and almost half of those have been in the last decade alone. So this is really encouraging um, data, just indicating that the research community is very committed to developing novel therapeutics in indications with small patient populations. So what does the drug development process really entail? We've heard a little bit about the preclinical work and a little bit about um, going into clinical trials, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes that we don't have nearly enough time to go over. So I want to give just sort of a brief highlight of what really has to be accomplished before we can go from the bench to the bedside. So before your drug even sees a human patient, you're in a research lab, you've identified a compound or a therapeutic that you think may have potential. So you move into testing um, with a mouse model. In Angelman syndrome, we're lucky enough to have a really nice Angelman syndrome mouse model. So if we see that our drug looks to be effective, looks to be safe, then we can move into larger animal models. Again, we're very lucky in the AS field that we now have an Angelman syndrome rat model that we're working to characterize and potentially down the road, you've heard a little bit about the Angelman syndrome pig. So these are all tools that we can use to help evaluate potential therapeutics. So once we've determined that we have a therapeutic that's potentially effective and appears to be safe, we can go to the FDA and get approval to go into clinical trials. So your first clinical trial is typically a smaller study. It's a low dose, it's just to assess safety. Once we know that our drug is safe, then we can move into a larger study. We can do a dose ranging or dose finding study where we can determine what the dosage is going to be that's going to be not only effective, but safe as well. And so we've heard some talk this morning about um, potential outcome assessments that should be used for clinical trials. And this is a huge question, particularly in the Angelman syndrome field. Um, some of you may have been there, but yesterday we had an all-day meeting trying to answer these questions. There are a lot of groups looking at this. When you're designing a clinical trial, your determination of whether you have a successful product or not is going to depend on the tests and assessments that you use to evaluate that. So we need to make sure that we're selecting these tests that are not only sensitive, but valid for the patient population that we're looking at. So once you've identified um, your outcome assessments that you think are going to be the most viable for your study. You can then design what we call a pivotal study, and this will be a larger study that's kind of your make it or break it for your program. This is where you're really going to determine if you have an effective drug product and if you should be moving forward with this or if you need to take a step back and reevaluate. So assuming that study goes well, you have a successful trial, you have good outcome assessments and good results, and you feel that very confident that you have a successful product, you'll then go to the FDA and have those conversations to file for authorization to market. So it's a long process. It takes years to get from the lab to the clinic. But we're going to talk a little bit today, once I turn it over to Ed, about the steps that we've taken so far to get us there. 
So when you're thinking about a future clinical trial, some of the questions that we hear are things like, will my child be eligible for your study? At this point, we don't know what our inclusion or exclusion criteria are going to be, so this is not something we can answer at this time. Questions like, when will treatment be available? Treatments are only going to be available once they've been approved um, by the regulators, but there are still things that you can be doing now to help ensure that we're moving forward and that we're progressing with this program like we should. So these are things like making sure that you're participating in the registry. So there were talks about this today as well. Making sure that we have your information about your children and we know what kind of patient population we should be targeting and looking at and the kind of availability that we're going to have for a clinical trial. Uh, making sure that you're keeping good medical records. So this is going to be important when you join any study. The first thing they do is collect as many um, medical history um, reports and records that you can get your hand on. This helps us really evaluate your child sort of overall and to then assess their progress within a study. And of course, the last thing is to participate. Um, all of you are here today, which is awesome. You get to hear about all the cool work that we have going on in the field, but making sure that you're staying involved with the foundations, the Facebook groups, the parent groups, things like this. We try to um, be really responsive with the community and make sure that we're reaching out to you and that you guys are reaching out to us with any questions as well. So as I mentioned, one of our programs is for AADC deficiency, and I'm just going to go through this briefly because I think it's a really exciting study that shows the um, potential for gene therapy success. And AADC deficiency, it's caused by a single gene mutation, which is the DDC gene, uh, the DDC gene. And so it codes for an enzyme that is responsible for converting the precursors for dopamine and serotonin into their active neurotransmitters. So without this gene, these children have extremely limited muscle strength, control, and movement. They're sometimes termed floppy. They have seizure-like symptoms. They require lifelong care, will have frequent hospitalizations. So you can imagine it's a huge financial and emotional burden on the families and caregivers. But there are some aspects of this disease that make it really attractive for a gene therapy um, option. For example, as I mentioned, it's a monogenic disease. We know which gene is deficient, so it makes it easy to make that selection of what we're going to target to put back. We also know that the affected cells remain intact for a long period of time, so we don't see significant neurodegeneration or cell loss. So in disorders where you have that, if you don't have the cells to target, then your gene therapy is potentially not going to be as effective because there's nothing for it to, to transfect. So there are three clinical studies with a total of 24 patients. Uh, these children have received a single administration of AAV with the AADC gene conjugated to it. And this was delivered directly to the putamen using stereotactic surgery. So as of now, we have uh, long-term evidence of efficacy. So for some of these children, they were treated over five years ago, and they're still showing significant clinical benefits and improvements. The rescue that we've seen is, has proven to be very durable. And in addition, in those children, we also have over five years now of safety information. So we've seen that there have been no significant concerns or issues, particularly relating to safety or toxicity. So this is really encouraging data. And so I want to show a couple of videos. The first is um, a little boy. He's two years old. He has AADC deficiency. And this is him before treatment. So you can see he's unable to really control his muscles. He's just kind of lying there, unable to do too much. So at one year post-treatment, he's able to sit up unassisted. He can reach for and grasp the mirror that's been handed to him. And over two years post-treatment, he's now able to stand. He can grasp the pegs out of the pegboard. And he can respond to his caretaker. He can, when she gives him a high five, he can coordinate his hand and smack her hand back. 
So this is really exciting data. This is showing that in a rare CNS disorder, a single gene disorder, if we replace this gene, we can see significant benefit and improvement. And not only that, these children continue to make significant gains and the treatment remains durable for this time. So how does this apply to our work with Angelman syndrome? As was mentioned previously, Agilis has a lot of experience working with the development of gene therapy products. And so we can take the information, the lessons that we've learned from our previous programs and translate that into our work with Angelman syndrome. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We want to make sure that we're constantly optimizing and improving and making sure that we're being efficient with our program and moving as quickly as we possibly can. So Angelman syndrome, similar to AADC, is very attractive for gene therapy. It's a monogenic disease. We know that UBE3A is the gene responsible for the majority of the underlying symptoms that we see. And again, similar to AADC, the cells that are affected remain intact. We don't see significant neurodegeneration or tissue loss in the Angelman syndrome brain. So I'm not going to go into too much detail about what Angelman syndrome is because I am, after all, speaking with the experts. But we know that it results from a loss of function of UBE3A, and this results in significant intellectual disability, developmental delays, learning and memory deficits, seizures, ataxia. So there are a lot of um, issues that we see across the population. It occurs in about 1 in 15,000 births, and we estimate there are approximately 10 to 20,000 individuals with Angelman syndrome in the U.S. So as I mentioned, one of the things that has really benefited our um, research with Angelman syndrome was the development of the AS mouse model. And this is really nice in that it recapitulates many of the major phenotypes that we see in humans with Angelman syndrome. So as Allison said earlier, both the human and AS UBE3A gene undergo imprinting. So only the maternal copy is active when inherited and the paternal copy is silenced. So both our human patients with Angelman syndrome and our AS mouse are more prone to seizures. They have motor defects and cognitive defects. So why are so many people interested in Angelman syndrome and gene therapy? So in 2011, when I was a graduate student still working with Dr. Weber, we published the first and still only paper showing a gene therapy rescue in an Angelman syndrome mouse model. So we used AAB9 conjugated to UBE3A, and we did a direct administration into the hippocampus of the AS mouse. And what we found was we were able to restore the level of UBE3A protein to near wild type levels. And you can see the picture of the hippocampus on the left side is our Angelman syndrome mouse that's been treated with our gene therapy. And on the pictures on the right, there's the wild type is the smaller picture on the top and a normal AS mouse untreated on the bottom. And you can see our untreated mouse has hardly any protein at all. There's very little that's being expressed naturally. So in addition to increasing the level of protein, we were able to improve the hippocampal dependent uh, learning and memory. So we can assess their cognition, their learning and memory through um, a different, through an assortment of behavior tasks. And one of those is associative fear conditioning. So very briefly, mice are placed into a square chamber with a grid floor. And during the training session, they receive several trains of a 30 second tone followed by a two second foot shock. So a normal wild type mouse will associate the chamber, their environment with that um, stimulus, the foot shock. And so what we see when we place them back into a box into that same environment, 24 hours later, the wild type mice freeze at very high rates because they're anticipating a foot shock. The Angelman mice, when placed back into that environment, don't freeze at nearly as high of levels, indicating a less robust association between their environment and the stimulus and a weaker memory for this, this situation for the training. For our Angelman syndrome mice that were treated with gene therapy, we see a significant increase in freezing compared to the untreated mice. And again, this was restored to near wild type levels. 
So we also use another task to, um, to assess their spatial learning, and that would be the hidden platform water maze. So I know it's going to talk about this in a little bit more detail, but just briefly, mice are placed into a round pool. It's divided into four quadrants. In one of those quadrants, we have a platform that's been submerged underwater and is hidden. And so mice receive four, t four trials each day for five days, and they're trained to use uh, spatial cues, visual cues placed above the pool to learn to navigate to that hidden platform. Mice are great swimmers, but they don't particularly enjoy it, so they seek out that platform. When we place them back into the pool and remove the platform 72 hours later, a wild-type mouse will spend the majority of its time searching over the area where that platform used to be. An Angelman mouse has a much less robust um, learning of where this was. Their search strategy is not as directed and targeted, so they tend to spend more time just kind of swimming in circles around the pool, hoping to bump into the platform. In our AS mice that were treated, they had significantly more platform crossings um, as compared to their uh, untreated counterparts, and the, if you look at the platform crossings, it indicates a more directed search strategy. So indicating that they have a better plan for where this platform was. So we also looked at um, electrophysiology. We can look at long-term potentiation. And this is basically an assessment of how your neurons are receiving and processing and transmitting signals. So we can take a brain out of our mouse. We can slice it, isolate the hippocampus, put it on a rig. We can artificially stimulate that and record the signal at the end of that pathway. And so this is really thought to be the cellular mechanisms underlying learning and memory. So it was nice to see the correlation between our behavior tasks and our LTP. So a normal Angelman syndrome mouse has a significant reduction in LTP compared to a wild type mouse. And we were able to improve this in our Angelman mice that received gene therapy. So based on this study, we found that we were able to normalize the protein level in the hippocampus of our treated mice using an AAV gene therapy. As a result of this increased protein, LTP was improved. We were able to recover the associative learning and memory defect as seen with the fear conditioning task and restore spatial learning. So this was a really nice proof of concept study that indicated to us that gene therapy may have significant potential in Angelman syndrome, but there's a long way to go from looking at a mouse model to getting into a human clinical trial. And so at this time, I'm gonna turn the talk over to Ed so that he can sort of update you guys on all the work that's been done to get us there. Uh, you guys are fading fast, I can tell. So you're getting further and further in your seats as the day goes on. Uh, we're, we're, we're getting close to the end. Um, uh, just about three things before I actually get started here. Um, the first thing is, is that uh, I, I can't tell you how cool it is to have Jennifer up here. Um, so like I'm, I'm her scientific dad, so to speak. So, you know, she came through my lab and now she's up giving a talk and working for a company. So. I feel a little bit proud about that. Uh, the other thing is, this is amazing. I'm gonna take a picture real quick of you guys. I'm gonna put it on my website, so you guys, if you wanna uh, come to my website, you can download it. So everybody smile. No, everybody. Yeah, there's <laughs> three people on there. That's, that's awesome. Um, and, and the last thing I wanna do before I get into the data is, is talk about Agilis a little bit, because I've done a lot of work for uh, a lot of different companies, a lot of different um, uh, biopharm uh, companies. I did work for uh, Disruptive Nutrition and, and did some really great stuff there. Um, Agilis was a company that came to me, and I've had several companies that, that have come to me and wanted to work with me, not just uh, analyze their whatever their product is or evaluate it in the AS mouse, but actually do research and development. And, and I've been very leery about that as being in academia, um, but the people at Agilis are really great people, and they really care. We looked at the stuff that they did with the AADC. Um, it just seemed like a, a really good partnership, and we've done some really, really great work. And uh, since then, I've been able to recruit Dr. Nash and doing some of this work as well. 
Okay, so let's, I, I, what I wanted to do is I want to kind of give you a, a flavor or at least a, an idea of some of the challenges that we're up against when we start talking about doing preclinical data uh, and looking at gene therapy. And so this is just a, a cartoon. You'll see these, you'll see these on posters, you'll see these on presentations. Let's see if I get the mouse to work so you can see it on both sides, that's awesome. Um, so, so this little cartoon is, is what we have as a representation of the gene that we put into the AAV. And so, you know, these little TR2s at the, on each end, um, those little sequences actually get it packaged in. Um, and here's our UBE3A gene represented by this arrow, which is, you know, a chunk of DNA. Uh, and then we have this little promoter region at the front. Uh, that sits in the front of the gene and allows expression. So no matter where it goes, in all that DNA, once that virus gets in there, you, you have to have something to actually turn it on so that it'll start producing the protein of interest in, in, this, uh, in this case, UBE3A. So there are literally dozens of different types of promoters out there. We narrowed it down to about six different promoters that we wanted to use. Um, as Dr. Wilson talked about earlier, is, is, uh, you know, there's three different isoforms. Which isoform do you use? Um, there's a lot of different AAVs. We used AAV9, uh, but there are at least 10 common types of, of AAV. There's a lot of other AAVs that are being produced, so how many of those do you want to use in combination? Um, and then the route of administration, which was discussed earlier as well. You know, do you, do you go intrathecal? Do you go into the spinal cord? Or do you do um, cystina magna? Or do you uh, target a particular brain region, the hippocampus? We know the hippocampus is involved in learning and memory, and maybe that's where we want to target this. So, so, you know, you could come up easily with 10 routes of administration for this. So if you start thinking about this with six promoters, three isoforms, 10 common isotypes, and 10 routes of administration, you have 1,800 different combinations. Okay, so you, you can't, there's no way you can do that. What Jen just showed earlier was basically her dissertation research. I mean, it took her two years to do that. Uh, it took a lot of time, and we, you know, we kind of stuck with the AAV9, and we injected it in the hippocampus, and we did a lot of work. But even when you get it in there, you still have to figure out, is it doing something? Is it expressing? Is what it's expressing really active? Is it going to do what you want it to do? Um, uh, you know, you have to evaluate these animals behaviorally, electrophysiologically. Um, do they change this, the symptoms or the phenotypes of that, that particular mouse? And you have to do controls on top of this as well. So a lot of times what we'll do instead of UBE3A, we'll put in the green fluorescent protein, which was shown earlier, and it, all the neurons kind of glow green so you can see where that distribution is, all right? So this is a lot of work, and there's no way that you can look at 1,800 different combinations of this uh, and come up with the preclinical data that you need. So you gotta refine it down. You gotta use your expertise and some of the work that other people have done and kind of pave the way and narrow this down so where you're just looking at a few of these reporters what, what isoform do you want, uh, what viral uh, isotype, and, uh, and what is the route of administration, and that's where this preclinical data comes from. Okay, so this little complicated piece of equipment here is an electrophysiology, uh, electrophysiology uh, rig. Um, like Jen said, we can make little tiny slices and we can put it on here. So really the question is, you inject the virus in, however that route may be, is it doing something? Is it changing how the neurons communicate with each other? And this is one way that you can actually look at that and quantitate it. Now, I know you've seen a whole ton of data. Um, you'll see a lot of these in the future. Uh, if you guys have been in here in the past, you've seen these. This is a, a, a typical long-term potentiation experiment. So if you see a graph that's got a bunch of dots on it like this, you go, oh, okay, that's what they're talking about, LTP. And all this is, is it's a, it's a cellular model for understanding how memory works, right? So you're up, you're, you're sitting in your seat, you're listening to my voice, you're looking at the, the screen. Um, all that input is coming in as stimulus. It gets processed through your hippocampus. Uh, and hopefully, if you can remember this tomorrow, it's laid down as permanent memory, okay? So there's, a, there's a, an effect that takes place where neurons are communicating and that communication is increased enough so that it, that pathway is laid down and it lasts a long time, okay? So memories last for your entire life. Hopefully you'll remember this for the rest of your life, okay? So, I know I'm really putting a lot of pressure on you. Um, so what we've done here, instead of looking at a screen and listening to, to a voice, we just give high frequency stimulation at this little arrow. 
So we're simulating the same thing that you're undergoing right now, and then we're seeing how much that communication goes up in that hippocampal slice across a real particular set of synapses. That's it. It's actually pretty straightforward. Come to the lab, two weeks of your time, eight hours a day, and I can get you to do this, I promise you. Um, what we saw when we put in our AAV uh, and we injected it was that we could recover the long-term potentiation defect um, in this particular animal, uh, and set of animals. Okay, so the blue is where we should be. These are uh, wild type, our typical animals. The green is our Angelman animals, and you can see that potentiation goes down. It doesn't last very long, and it goes almost back down to baseline. So if we're thinking about learning and memory and plasticity, this is kind of what's happening in the animal model when we test it. Um, and in the red is our treated animal. So and all of these things that I'm going to show you, if the red gets to the point where the blue is, that's what we're shooting for. Now we're having a physiologic effect on these animals that we're giving this AAV to. Um, and if you take an average of that last uh, 10 minutes, you can see that the red bar and the blue bar are getting pretty close to each other. And this is exactly what we want. So we're getting an effect. The protein is having an effect on those neurons. Um, she talked about hidden platform uh, water maze, and, and it, you can explain this, but you, re you really kind of have to see it. So this is uh, our big pool of water. You can see the mouse in here. You can see that there's the platform, but the mouse can't see that. It's underneath the surface of the water, all right? And then there's cues on the walls where the mouse can actually spatially determine where it is and then swim to that platform. So it's the same thing if you get up out of your seat in a dark movie theater and you go to the restroom or you go to the snack bar, you come back, you find your seat again. You know, you're not looking around to see where you were. You use spatial cues as well. You did it when you went and got your lunch and came back and sat down. So we're tying into that exact same thing in this mouse model, all right? So let me play this. So here's a mouse. Now this is being, he's being trained, right? So he's gonna swim around and he's orienting himself with the pool. Um, we do this over and over and over again, day after day, and eventually he'll find that platform. All right, so this is, this is the learning phase of it. And so when he finds that platform, we let him sit on that platform. He's like, cut out of the water, finally found, found the platform, and he'll orient himself to where he is, okay? So after we do that for five or six days until he's pretty good at just swimming to that platform, we kind of trick him. So we go from the learning, okay, to the memory phase. And the memory phase is done by simply removing the platform. And then after so, much, so many seconds, seeing how many times it crosses that platform or how many times it, it spins over here where that platform was. And this is what we call a probe test. So there's a learning section of this and then there's the memory section of this. And you can see that this mouse is looking. He's like, God dang, the platform was just here yesterday. So he's swimming around, he remembers where that platform was, but it's a really good way to quantify where he's looking and how, he's, how that search strategy uh, is for him to find where that platform was. Okay, so that's hidden platform water maze. Okay, so here's the effect of our AAV. So we see that it has this effect on hippocampal synaptic function. What about learning and memory? All right, so here's our training phase here. You can see every time it goes into the pool, and this, is, this represents four times a day, it gets better and better and better at finding the platform. And pretty soon it can find it at like 10 seconds. And then we give it some time. We let it get enough time for it to forget. And then we stick it back in and we remove that platform and we say, okay, how well can it remember? All right, so here is our um, sham injected wild type. So these are our typical mice, all right? So this is a heat map. The more times it spends over the platform, you know, the more color. And you can see it's looking for that platform over and over again. Here's our AS mouse. You can see that it doesn't as much. Um, it's spending a little bit more time here, but not clearly as much as the wild type. But now look at our viral injected mouse. That heat map really shows that it's looking, the strategy is to look for where that platform was. And we've done this to where it's you know three or four days later. So we give it time to forget, we put it back in, the non-injected mouse does not find the platform. So not only are we affecting synaptic plasticity, this cellular model for learning and memory, but we're also affecting how it remembers, all right? And these are kind of our, our outcomes, right? This is what we want to see. If we give a route of administration with this particular protein and this particular isoform, can we have an effect on these things like synaptic function, synaptic communication, and really learning and memory? Can we recover those things? 
All right. We have a whole laundry list of things, and I could stand up here for two hours uh, and talk to you about all the different behavioral tests that we do. But we know this, this model really well, and we can really see if, the, if what we're doing is having a physiologic effect. So this is a, um, uh, a AAV uh, that we're using the human gene. So we, we started off with the, with the mouse gene, and we say, why are we doing preclinical work with the mouse gene if we're going to be injecting the human gene? So now we've done this with the, with the human gene. We've done a lot of testing to make sure that the human gene is looking like the, the uh, mouse gene and how it functions and its activity. Um, we've done this now in the AS rat. The AS rat does not have a strong a phenotype on the uh, synaptic plasticity, but we can see, is that red bar getting closer to the blue bar? Yes, it is. All right, so we, we are actually having that effect. Um, so just really quickly, I don't want to bog you down with a lot of data, but um, we know that this AAV-based gene therapy, we can target regions with it, which is really nice. So where is the dysfunction? Again, is it in the cortex? Is it in the hippocampus? Do we have to try to get that entire brain uh, to express the protein. These are the things that we're trying to determine. Um, and that the human UBE3A has the same effect. It has the same effect as if we put in the mouse gene like we did uh, back when Jen was a graduate student. If we do the same thing with the human gene, we have the same effect. We can rec rescue those phenotypes. Um, and again, remember what those LTP uh, data look like. We can improve that LTP, that synaptic communication, uh, and also learning and memory. So we're going to kind of switch gears here and go to um, what, what is, it's probably a misnomer that we're calling it protein replacement because it's still gene replacement, but it's in, we're trying to do things in a little bit different way. So what you've heard now is, is we take this virus, we inject it into the brain. Um, what we try to do is get you know, as many neurons as we possibly can, and this involves this route of administration. How do we, how do, we do this? How, how much virus can we get? And how many neurons can we have uh, actually produce that protein? Um, and then eventually what happens is over time, that gene will start to express the protein, and now you have the protein everywhere in the brain, especially in the neurons where it's absent. In the secreted protein gene therapy, uh, we've done things a little bit different. And, and one of the reasons why Kevin Nash is up here, um, Kevin's a, a, a good friend of mine, a good colleague. Um, he works with me at the University of South Florida. This is really his brainchild to come up with this idea of, uh, you know, if we can't get all of the neurons to have the gene, maybe we can just get a few of the cells to have the gene and then put a little bit of sequence on that protein so that it secretes out of the neuron so that it secretes out of the cell and goes to its neighboring cell and goes into that. So now we're not trying to get the, the virus everywhere, we just want to try and get the protein everywhere. All right. So we make a little, a little piece on there to, to signal it to go outside of that cell where it's been expressed and then get picked up in its neighboring cell. So in this way, we can do an injection, not try to get all the brain, but just get a few of those cells around, say, the ventricle and turn those into little protein factories, right? So now you, when you produce the protein and we have that single signal peptide on it, it gets distributed throughout the brain. Okay, so this is really where this kind of research and, and discovery method comes in. This is still uh, really very experimental. We're still trying to figure out how far the protein will get. Is it still active after it's been outside of the cell? Um, and and does, will it work as well as what we've seen with these other types of therapies? So I'm just going to show you one really quick experiment that we did uh, to test this. So we tried doing this, this secreted protein uh, strategy, and we injected in um, one part of the hippocampus. And the hippocampus, especially in a, in a mouse or a rat, kind of, kind of goes around the back of their head like this. So you can inject in one area, and then you can record in another. So where we're recording, uh, we're not transfecting or transducing the, um, those cells to produce the protein. Um, but can we recover the LTP defect on this part of the hippocampus if we inject over here with the secreted protein? And the answer to that is yes, we can. Okay. So when we uh, inject here and we record here after five weeks, uh, letting the, the protein be produced and kind of secrete out, uh, to the neighboring neurons. We do our LTP induction study, and sure enough, what we get is a recovery of that LTP defect. 
So it's a different strategy. It's another way to do it. It's another way to look at it. It's still in development, but it's, it's very, very promising. So just really in conclusion, um, AAV secreted gene therapy uh, can, can produce functional UBE3A protein. So we've done assays on this. Uh, not only is it producing functional protein, but it appears to be getting in neighboring neurons, and it's enough to recover at least the LTP defect that we see. Um, and of course, we've got this really nice AS rat. Um, the brain isn't a lot bigger, but it's a little bit bigger. Uh, these animals are much more complex, and, uh, and we'll be uh, looking at both of these strategies, not only AAV, but also the AAV and the secreted protein strategy in these rats as we continue on. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it back over to, to Jen for the conclusion. Um, thank you all for staying. It's really awesome to see oh, so many people stay for the entire uh, session. Uh, there's been some really exciting things going on, and, and, uh, and thank you for the picture as well. So I just wanted to finish our talks today by highlighting some of the accomplishments that Agilis has made to date in the field of Angelman syndrome. As I mentioned previously, we have orphan product designation in both the US and EU. We've now progressed from the original gene therapy paper looking at the mouse UBE3A gene into comparing the human UBE3A gene delivered via AAV. And so we've shown that we get similar improvements in rescue using this gene compared to the mouse. So that's just one step closer to human trials. And as Ed's covered, he's tested many different combinations of promoters and other factors that could potentially affect the design of our AAV vector. And I know that we had a rather quick talk today. We only had an hour, so I can't even begin to highlight the amount of work that has gone into into making this decision for our final viral vector product. But I assure you, it was a significant amount of work and we're very excited to be where we are now. So we've looked at several routes of administration. So that's gonna be something that's important. We wanna make sure that we're injecting this um, viral vector into an area that's gonna be effective. We need to make sure that we're getting into the brain and that we're covering a significant amount of area that's going to result in a rescue of the symptoms that we see. So we've also um, spearheaded and participated in an outcome measure and biomarker initiative. So this is called ABOM, and this is a group of researchers across all sorts of um, backgrounds, experience, in Angelman syndrome that are working together to develop and evaluate potential outcome assessments. So as I mentioned earlier, this is gonna be really important once we move into clinical trials, making sure that we have good measures to assess whether our viral vector is gonna work or not. And so right now we're finishing up our work evaluating our lead candidate in an AS rat model. And this is really sort of our last step for finalizing our viral vector and moving forward from there. So where does that leave us? What's our next steps? Um, at Agilis, we're planning to, in 2018, complete our um, safety studies, or to, to, to begin and complete our safety studies, I should say. And this is gonna be really important to um, inform us as to the dosage that we should be using moving forward, things like that, making sure that we're selecting a dose that's going to be safe and effective. So then you move into manufacturing, and this is a huge undertaking. And this is something that's gonna be ongoing over the next couple years. It's important to make sure that each batch of your virus is going to be comparable to your previous batches, making sure that your product is consistent. And once we have that complete, we're developing our phase one clinical trial protocol. So what does this involve? Um, there are still several variables and questions that need to be answered. Um, for example, we need to know what age um, our participants are gonna be. We need to evaluate our risk benefit profile. Our goal is to be in clinical trial by the end of 2019. And in order to meet these goals, we plan on 
continuing our discussions and communications with the FDA, including our pre-IND in 2018. So we're very excited about the progress that has been made, and we look forward to sharing more about this with you at the next conference. And at this time, I'll take any questions. Mike. Oh, great, thanks. Um, I think I can speak on behalf of everyone in the room. No one wanted to interrupt you, um, but we're also crazy excited about the end of 2019. <laughs> so can we just give them a round of applause, please? Any questions? Okay, hi, thank you a lot. Sorry for my English, I'm a French Canadian, okay? Uh, I want to ask you for, uh, about the three isoforms. You were talking about that, but you didn't speak a lot more, so can you just, did you pick one? Do you take three of them? What is the, I don't understand. Yeah, so we know that there are three different isoforms of UBE3A, and this is still currently being worked on in several different labs, trying to really understand um, the differences in, in each of these isoforms. How does this affect function? What is the purpose of each one of these? So based on work that's been done previously in other labs, we selected one isoform and moved forward with that for our trial. Okay, two questions. One is, um, have you all determined, or do you feel it's important or not important, um, what cell type you need to aim the um, vector towards, or do you feel that just getting it in the brain and letting it spread out will means that you don't really need to choose a particular cell type? So, what we've looked at is targeting neurons specifically. So. There are other types of cells, um, but as long as we're getting expression in the neurons and we're getting a sufficient amount of protein, then that's, our, that's really been our concern at this point. But not a specific neuron is what I was getting No. At. One more thing really fast. The secretion, um, you and the secreted protein, is it targeted towards a certain um, cell type? Or how does it go into a pro uh, another neuron? I can answer that one. So, <laughs> do you want to? Yeah, Kevin can answer that. Um, so th it, it's well known uh, that there are these small peptides called cell-penetrating peptides, and the most famous, uh, well-known one is from HIV, and it's called TAT. And so these small peptides, they enable the protein to cross the cell barrier, cell membrane. So you can imagine it's a way of the, just targeting a particular protein so that the cell now knows, oh, I need to take this protein up. So we have one signal that says, okay, I need to get out of the cell when I'm being made, and then another signal saying, oh, I need to go back into a cell. And so, in theory, you know, we'll have cells that are producing it, and then hopefully its neighbor and its friend will then take it back up again. It's, it's not about cell specific. Oh, yeah. No, if you, and it's not cell specific. It'll go up into any cell type. Yes. So in your um, mouse models and your electrophysiological data, do you have any uh, readout from duplication 15Q animals? Do you know what the output will be like if you turn the UBE3A into a dupe15Q with your gene therapy? No, so we don't have that information at this time, but that's something that we're going to plan to move forward with, and that'll help inform us for our dosing decisions at that point. Just curious, have you studied the permanency of the solutions that you've worked on so far? That's part one. And part two, um, my assumption is when you create an AS mouse, um, 
it doesn't live for a long enough time to build up the bad stuff. Is that GABA that might impact the efficacy of a UBE 3A treatment? So I was curious. I was thinking initially, oh, that the age of the mouse might impact you know, the, the research that you're doing, the success of the research that you're doing, but it's not necessarily the age of the mouse. It's at what point they became an AS mouse, right? Because downstream we know that, basically what I'm trying to get to is for our children, you know, we keep hearing the older they are, then maybe the less effective a gene treatment would be because there's bad, street, bad stuff that builds up downstream that might not be able to re be removed later. So I'm just curious, in your AS mouse models, do you allow the, the mice to have AS for a long time to possibly measure that aspect of the study? Or is it, do you, do you understand what I'm saying? So I'm gonna answer your question and you can let me know if, this is, if I understand it correctly. Um, so first of all, our AS mice actually do live a normal long mouse lifespan. So they're not like some of the other mouse models with early death or issues like that. So we can potentially treat older AS mice. Now for our work, we typically treat them as right as they're coming into adulthood. And this is really more effective for like behavior testing. So you could imagine that it might be more difficult to do like water maze or something with geriatric mice that you know are already gonna have potentially motor coordination problems or something like this. And now we're adding aging onto it. Um, so that's, you know, one potential issue with that. Um, as for how long, like, the permanency of this, you know, I'm not sure. I might have an answer as to the longest that you've left the virus. Yeah, so, so just to get everything in perspective here, uh, a, a mouse weans at three weeks, okay, and they're sexually active at, at, what, six weeks or seven weeks. I mean, they're, th their lifespan is really shortened down. So, if, uh, you know, they, I think they, they live around two years, you know, uh, 20, 26 months, something like that. So I've recorded from hippocampal slices of, of mice that were a month old and there's dysfunction there. And so I think that your, your question of when they become AS mice is when they're born. They're, they're, they're born with a maternal deficiency and, and you know, we, we test them when they're adults for a number of different reasons. I mean, we're, we're putting them through the paces so we wanna make sure that they're adults. Um, and we would like to do electrophysiology on their brains when they're fully formed. Um, as far as how long the, the gene lasts, I'll, I'll have Kevin answer that. Yeah, I mean, we can only go from other studies that, uh, and Jim Wilson, you know, spoke about this before, and, you know, he has some that goes out to 11 years. So, I, I mean, most of the work that's been done, uh, that once you put this vector in there, it, it just stays on. So it's, it's not going to turn off, yeah. Hi. With the um, increasing rate of genetic um, research, and I recently read an article, and in fact, I think Dr. Wilson was quoted in it, it was that the um, AAV virus production is, uh, can be an issue because there's not that many companies that make it, and in many cases, the pharmaceuticals companies themselves don't make the AAV, so um, I'm wondering if you have a solution for that, or do you make the AAV yourself, or do you outsource that, and how would you address the production problem without actually getting the delivery mechanism? Yeah, so we don't actually make it ourselves in-house. We work with another company that does that. Um, our solution was to plan ahead, and that's why I contact Ed and Scott frequently, very frequently, because we have very tight deadlines. It is an issue where there are a lot of companies that are trying to get in for manufacturing and they have limited bandwidth and capacity to do that. So you could potentially find your gene product and then realize that, okay, well the company that's gonna manufacture it for you doesn't have a slot available until a year, six months, something like that down the road. And so that's gonna set you back. So we've tried to be very proactive about that to make sure that something like manufacturing is not going to hold up our trial. 